Molly, I wanted to start by asking you about your most recent project. Um, for those who don't know, it's a film version of A Master Builder by Henrik Gibson, which you translated and in which you play the lead role of uh, Halvard Solness. It's directed by Jonathan Demme and based on a stage rehearsal process that went on for about 14 years, I believe, but was never actually <laughs> fully mounted as a production. Is that correct? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we spoke a little earlier this week about Ibsen. <laughs> That stage production directed by uh, Andre Gregory, your longtime collaborator, obviously. Um, we touched on how Ibsen's work has had a distinct ability, particularly when he first was being produced, to incite riots, to really foment a certain kind of social change. And I was reminded after we spoke of that line in uh, my dinner with Andre that you have, everybody's redefined the theater in such a trivial way. And so my question is rather two-part. Um, what was it about Ibsen and Master Builder in particular that you found compelling to revisit at this point in history, your personal history or our larger history? And as a playwright with very pronounced political concerns um, about where we're heading, do you think theater as a medium still has the ability to provoke uh, discomfort, outrage, any kind of social change in the way that Ibsen did? Uh, now, I don't know, it's very hard to see you all. <laughs> um, who here has heard of Ibsen? <laughs> okay, right. good, good, good. <laughs> so, uh, that's great. Have any of you, who has seen a play of Ibsen? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Obviously, in the time and the place that Ibsen was uh, living, it, uh, for part of his life, uh, he was just mocked and uh, people didn't uh, respect his plays very much, but for, a, many a good 20 years in there, uh, and he was angry and he left Norway and lived in exile. Uh, but for a good 20 years, uh, whenever he wrote a play, uh, it wasn't so much that people went to see it, but they bought the, the book. Uh, <laughs> his plays were really, in a way, almost more meant to be read than seen, and more people, I think, did read them than saw them. Some of them were so strange that uh, people didn't even think of performing them for decades after they were written. Uh, no one could figure out how they might be done. But uh, yes, people listened to what he had to say, and it, it did uh, somehow feed into the bloodstream of society. Obviously today, uh, theater uh, certainly in the United States is, is not so central. Uh, although, you know, Chicago is, is a theater town. How many people would go to one play or more in a year. Yeah. Oh, Whoa. that's great. <laughs> yeah. See where, yeah, in New York, you could not possibly find uh, a, such a crowd of people who would say that. Uh, it's a, um, this is a town where I think it's like the, the old days of Ibsen, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, we're, and we noted Ibsen's uh, play Ghosts actually had its world premiere in Chicago in, in Norwegian, and I can't remember the year, but it was, yeah. so we have sort of a connection with Ibsen going way back. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, in general, you could say that the writer, the artist, 
certainly the playwright occupies a very marginal role in the United States. And um, I've always loved Ibsen myself because there's a kind of uh, irrational but inexorable logic that uh, carries along from one line to the next in an absolutely irresistible way, uh, which I find very magnetic and which somehow to me seems to paint a truthful portrait of life. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I have always yeah. felt that and I, I, uh, I still do. And that particular play, The Master Builder, is a actually Master Builder Solness in Norwegian. That play is really about a dangerous kind of uh, uh, dominant personality, someone who wants to control the universe who wants to uh, control other people, dominate them. Uh, obviously, that is uh, applicable to, uh, you know, that's our problem. Yeah. Uh, really. Uh, the desire to dominate and uh, control, in a way, has gotten us into the environmental disaster that we have, and it's gotten us into the uh, political or international disaster. So it's an interesting play about all those things. Well, first of all, I believe, like, uh, for example, uh, Noam Chomsky. How many people have ever heard of Noam Chomsky? <laughs> yes, a lot of people. <laughs> So Chomsky, uh, he, uh, when I, I first uh, learned about him in the 80s, I was flabbergasted by the fact that he published articles in completely obscure magazines that, that had the tiniest circulations. When he could have made a greater effort and <laughs> at least gotten into the nation or some <laughs> publication that had some kind of circulation beyond 10,000 people. But he clearly seemed to feel, and still does, uh, you know, if you send, it's a little bit, I mean, not to, uh, be flippant, but it is like a virus. You can uh, have a very few cases at the beginning, and uh, it can spread if the if the circumstances are right. Uh, it can spread to a lot of people. Your thoughts. So, I sometimes you know, console myself with that because I, I'm, a, I'm a, a very ambitious person and I would like my thoughts to, to travel way out there. <laughs> um, and I know that theater is, is, a, is one of the slowest means of delivery. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, you know, it, I, sometimes it, it, it's possible to just talk to a few people and then it, it can sure. spread. For me, I don't think specific thoughts that I would have or specific things that I would write would be helpful to the world. Exactly. I think um, if you 
write something with some intelligence, if you play music with some intelligence, even if you paint a painting with some intelligence, that could counteract the ignorance and de-education that uh, is one of the problems, certainly in our country, in deliberate policy since the 1980s to, in a way, uh, defund education and, and have a more docile and stupid population. <laughs> and if you, I feel that uh, if you can do a good job in an artistic field, poetry, uh, you know, sure. playing the violin, whatever, it, um, it, it, it's somehow, it might help to counteract that um, trend. Well well, and you've written and talked several times about your evolution politically from, I don't know how you would have described it, a left liberal uh, to being a socialist. Um, in the introduction to your collection of essays that came out a few years ago from Chicago's Haymarket Press, you said, I suppose I'm something like what my mother would have been if she'd gone down into her basement and stumbled on Eleanor Roosevelt murdering babies there. Um, now, I've just read through many of your plays in a pretty condensed period of time. <laughs> so I have this impression of your work as a playwright moving from very intense interpersonal and sexual conflicts, if you've seen Our Late Night or Marie and Bruce. Our Late Night actually was first produced in Chicago in 1977 at Steppenwolf. We were talking about the fact that every 10 years for a while, Steppenwolf seemed to do a play by Mr. Sean, uh, 1977, Our Late Night, 1987, Aunt Dan and Lemon, and then 1997, uh, the designated mourner. Um, but I definitely see an, a trend, evolution, in having read these, as I said, very close in time, from the, the very uh, scatological, sexual, very violent interpersonal conflicts of those earlier plays to plays that are contemplating more the nature of, of larger evil, whether it's uh, people who are applauding and abetting it, as in Aunt Dan and Lemon, uh, the narrator in The Fever, who is intensely aware of it, but seems to be on this spiral where and he cannot figure out what to do about being confronted with it. Um, and I know you've said that you're superstitious about talking about your process as a playwright, but I think my question is, did you have a particular Eleanor Roosevelt murdering babies moment um, <laughs> politically that influenced how you chose to address the issues raised in some of these later plays? That sentence um, <laughs> was, it was, was based on the fact that my parents were uh, supporters of Franklin Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt, a little more liberal than Mr. Roosevelt, but, but very, these were uh, part of the American, the regular American system. They were Democrats and uh, you know, when my parents were growing up, uh, getting into their 30s and 40s, they, they had a very benign uh, view of uh, the possibilities of, of uh, our country and, and really saw us amazingly, as the good guys, really. Certainly, in World War II, uh, you know, many people in Europe were, were pleased when the American soldiers marched in. And, uh, and then when they met them, they found them delightful and said, these are great guys. And, uh, uh, so my, my, and I compared myself to my, my very benign mother who, <laughs> who wished good things on everybody, uh, but what if she had learned that the, you know, the, the system that she felt affection for was not as, as nice as she had uh, imagined. And uh, 
somehow this is the, you know, possibly to anybody boring story of my life that uh, there are a lot of things I didn't understand until I was in my 40s. And uh, there really was no uh, one um, event. I mean, I, uh, it's a question of what books you, you read, really. Um, now, my book of essays is published by Haymarket Books of Chicago. And when I was, let's say, 39, I wouldn't have read a book published by <laughs> that press because I would have thought, that's not reliable. If, if that publishing house was telling me the truth, it would be more successful. And I, it, they'd be everywhere, and I would know about them. Uh, I thought, well, I was basic. I went to a high school where the New York Times was really what the Bible is for a fundamentalist uh, <laughs> right. school. Right. Uh, this is the word that is true, you know. And at a certain point, I came to, well, Noam Chomsky is published by, you know, at that time, the South End Press. Who had ever heard of that? How could his book have anything true in it? Uh, <laughs> You know, and as, as was reported about me, I did go to, uh, you know, the supposedly uh, respectable uh, Harvard University, where, where I was, I'm proud to say, they were the worst years of my life. <laughs> uh, nothing worse has happened yet. I'm expecting worse things. <laughs> what, I, but I... Uh, I, I I did believe that the books that they were giving me were probably the most reliable books. And at a certain point, I thought, well, uh, I should read other books, and I should read different things from what I've been reading. And uh, that ultimately... Uh, I studied history, but I didn't study the history I should have been studying, in a way. Uh, I actually learned a lot about Chinese history, which is great. And if I had a good memory, I could absolutely shock certain people <laughs> by uh, how much I know about some of those right. uh, <laughs> uh, dynasties. But. You know, in subsequent years, I, uh, let's say I grew up listening to people, politicians say, this is the greatest country in the world, and kind of thinking, well, it, it might be. But now, I sort of, uh, in some ways, it is the worst, because uh, the, um, the genocide of the of the indigenous people is uh, on a scale that is so big that you it kind of dwarfs most of the subsequent events, <laughs> and then slavery to come in on top of that is a fantastic uh, tale. So the fact that now people are afraid of the United States and find it, you know, an enemy, uh, that doesn't uh, really shock me sure. anymore. And uh, yeah, I was reading, really, and then traveling, but the traveling came after uh, 
the reading, really. And uh, you have to say thinking, right. just taking on board some of the realities and, uh, and facing the fact about myself that, uh, uh, that I was involved and that, you know, every time I pay my taxes, I'm involved in, in uh, the, the, in killing people and they're being killed uh, largely to preserve the world that we know in which I am having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the people being killed are having a bad time. So, uh, you, know, what, uh, you know, what is one going to make of that? So was there a conscious decision at some point to address that more head on in your plays than you perhaps had been prior to say, you know, Aunt Dan and Lennon or? I, 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 I basically write, uh, I don't disapprove of someone writing a political play. If someone can say, I am going to write a play about uh, the injustice of capital punishment. I, if they wrote a play that, that right. was meaningful, I'd be impressed. Yeah. I have never proceeded that way, and I don't know how to, and I don't try to, okay. because I think... Uh, I use a more irrational process, <laughs> but just as in our dreams, uh, presidents and and uh, prime ministers might appear, or politicians might appear in a dream, uh, or vague scenes of mayhem that have political roots might appear in a dream, uh, somehow society and political things have come into my plays, even though I write them the same way that I wrote my earlier plays. Okay, fair enough. I guess one of the things that often might come up when you write either essays or plays that are sort of confronting privilege, and you've written many times about having grown up as a child of privilege, although you did not always live as a person of privilege. Uh, the question then comes up, so you've identified these problems. You've, you know, certainly everything you've said is pretty much incontestable, and we can talk about the fact that everything that we enjoy pretty much comes from the misery of others. If we talk about the clothes that we wear being made in sweatshops, or as Mike Daisy talked about in his Steve Jobs piece, the conditions under which these you know, wonderful devices are made. Um, so then the question comes up, you've identified the problem. Do you ever feel that you're then being confronted by people saying, well, so what do you do about it? What, what have you changed now that you identify as socialist? Now that you have identified this problem, what does that translate into in action? And do you have an answer for that? Do you ha feel that anything has changed in the way you approach daily living, perhaps, or? Well, I have to say, I have expected more people to challenge me and call me a hypocrite than actually have done that. <laughs> um, obviously, I am uh, to some extent incapable of uh, coming to an answer that is satisfying. I believe in being an activist, and I don't know quite how else to do it except to respond uh, to the events that arise and march in the streets, write things, uh, 
talk to my friends. Now, that's not a comprehensive program. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that uh, uh, many people, not me, but many people dreamed that uh, electing an intelligent, sensitive president might make a change because some of the presidents we've had have been ignorant and uh, insensitive, filled with uh, crude hatred, um, you name it. Now we've elected an intelligent, sensitive president, and to me, uh, I think the fact that I'm able to stand here and talk is, is a testament to, to him, because I think if Sarah Palin were elected, <laughs> and, or Luke Perry were elected, or many of the, well, you're laughing, but I mean, there was a t time when people laughed much more at the idea that Ronald Reagan yeah. uh, would be elected. Uh, and certainly, I'm sure if you had known George Bush when he was a young, younger man and, and people said, well, he'll be president one day, people would laugh. Uh, I think the surveillance powers that Mr. Snowden revealed could be applied against me or a lot of other people, maybe even some in this room, uh, if Obama were not president and they were president, that's coming, you know, around right. the corner. But Obama has not uh, even prosecuted the criminals from the previous administration, much less made a great dent in the uh, control of our country by the one percenters or in the uh, cruelty toward uh, poor people on Earth that uh, the United States is is known for. Not in the United States, but outside. That's where we're known for. So that alternative is 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 not getting anywhere. Maybe I don't know. Uh, Seventy-five years ago, I might have been a communist. And uh, I know some of my very favorite people are <laughs> communists, and maybe some of them are here tonight. But I don't believe in that, <laughs> really. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, for the... And they, if they're here, they will tell you that, you know, you shouldn't... Yes, things happened, you know. <laughs> But don't let that, uh, you know, don't hold that against the party. <laughs> uh, I do, I would say, I, I love the writings of Karl Marx, and I think he's, you know, certainly a profound genius who I uh, revere. But the, the, um, one party rule by a vanguard supposedly representing the people is uh, is not a program that I subscribe to. And there's a bloodthirsty side to it that goes against my more pacifistic leanings. So uh, I have to throw it back to everybody else, what are we going to do? Because staying on the track we're on, uh, well, we won't even, I mean, there won't even be human life on the planet in a hundred years if we stay on the track that we're on. And it's very, very hard to know how to get off it. Uh, I mean, I personally, uh, 
am in the... I respond to some extent to the things that happen, and uh, but but that isn't a full program. Sure. And about being a hypocrite in my personal life, I am, uh, you know, I enjoy uh, uh, apple pie cupcakes as <laughs> that, that were recently brought to my attention. Um, uh, I enjoy pancakes. Um, I, I have the desire to lead a bourgeois life that uh, many people do. Well, I wanted to ask, if you'll forgive me, for quoting you to yourself one more time, and maybe this is a segue from what, you know, what, what from the terrors to maybe some of the consolations of our contemporary life. Um, in your essay, The Quest for Superiority, you said, people beguiled by the beautiful are less dangerous to others than those obsessed by the thought of supremacy. So I'm just very curious as to what now today do you define as beautiful and what beguiles you? Well, what I was saying in that uh, essay uh, is I actually do believe this, that um, uh, People who are obsessed with poetry, for example, uh, it is not impossible that they could also be mass murderers. <laughs> but if you're really more interested in poetry than in power, you may be a less harmful person. And uh, yes, personally, I mean, the question that obviously we all must sometimes think about is maybe we all do have the uh, capability of, of being a brutal guard at Auschwitz or Abu Ghraib. I mean, that may be inside us. And yet, a lot of people we know go through a whole lifetime being rather nice. <laughs> Why is that, and how can that be true? And I do, uh, and yes, obviously, you know, people write at length about the fact that a few of the Nazi murderers listened to music. And they did. I'm not sure they understood it the same way that I do. Right. Uh, I think that if people were interested, I mean, I myself listen to a lot of music, classical music. I know a lot of people who play classical music, their minds are occupied with music. They're not really excited by the thought of power or, in a funny way, even money. I am greedy for the things of the world, but it's a question of if they were gradually taken away from me, how brutal would I become in order to get them back? Um, I think that uh, I, I do have a kind of uh, crazed belief that uh, involvement in art is quite an innocent and benign activity. And uh, I, I think it should be, uh, it's one of the things that uh, I would encourage in human beings. Uh, and of course, you know, the Bush administration 
was run by people who honestly were not involved in poetry at all. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but he's painting now. <laughs> that, yes, <laughs> exactly. So I know that you're, uh, uh, you're, you have a friendship and are quite close with Mark Strand. What particularly, in his poetry, what is something that beguiles you? What did you find as a connection with, with his writing? Uh, well, I've had the opportunity to, yes. I mean, Mark Strand is, uh, well, he taught in Chicago for a while and uh, has, well, in my little book of essays, I interview Chomsky and I interview Mark Strand. They do, in a way, <laughs> represent ideals uh, for me. Uh, one of the things that Mark says in the interview that I found particularly amazing was he said that uh, he didn't necessarily understand all of his own poetry. He didn't understand every line that he wrote because he said, well, if I had to be sure that I understood every line that I wrote, I couldn't be in my poetry any smarter than I am. He wanted his poetry to be smarter than he was as he walked down the street. And um, I found that very inspiring. And it was in a way, uh, yeah, he was sort of saying that his, his unconscious was, was greater than the, the guy that he is or pretends to be every day. Somehow, that was uh, a thought that was, uh, I don't know, it could benefit people. I'm reminded in some of the things that he talked about of one of my favorite <coughs> quotes from Flannery O'Connor, who is one of my idols, and in her collection, Mystery and Manners, which I think is a fantastic collection of essays on writing, she talked about hope, and she said people who don't have hope, not only don't read novels, they don't write them, because to write fiction and to encounter fiction is to become, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but to become very encumbered by everything that is dirty and human in the world, and also with the mystery of what it is to be human. What I think is interesting in your writing, and I've just only now made this connection to some of what was going on in Master Builder and Ibsen's writing, is that there is this beautiful, sometimes horrifying confluence of things that seem very real and things that are very mysterious and very frightening and very dark. And um, I don't know that you've perhaps worked out for yourself why that happens in that way, but I do find that that's one of the things that's so compelling about you as an essayist and as a playwright. And so having had the advantage of being able to read all of these plays back to back, I feel as if I've been on a rather strange journey <laughs> in your writing. Mm -hmm. um, do you go back and read them? And th can you think about what it was to have written that particular piece at that particular time? And do you recognize the person who wrote those things at some point? Yes, sadly, <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I haven't, uh, I mean, when I read an old play, I get back into the state of mind I was in, in a way. I, although I do, my taste changes 10%. So I do rewrite all my plays. I've rewritten all of them. Okay. And uh, some of them even have a few different versions in print. Uh, I do write things that that uh, I hope are smarter than me. I mean, I do follow Mark's idea in the sense that some of my plays venture outside of the realm that I can explain. There are things in my plays, there are questions, pretty reasonable ones, or 
or uh, natural ones that someone could ask that I can't answer. Some of, some of the plays make more sense than others, and they all uh, have reached, by the time I've published them or put them on stage, I'm prepared to defend them, or I believe <laughs> that they're right, but there are questions that I can't answer or okay. things I can't explain. I think we're going to go to question and answer, but I'm going to ask you to indulge me one more time. I just wanted to read the last part of the very last paragraph of the, of the Fever, which is one of my absolute favorites of your work. Uh, what will be home? My own bed, my night table. And on the table, what? On the table, what? Blood, death, a fragment of bone, a fragment, a piece of a human brain, a severed hand. Let everything filthy, everything vile sit by my bed, where once I had my lamp and clock, books, letters, presents for my birthday, and left over from the presents bright colored ribbons. Forgive me, forgive me, I know you forgive me, I'm still falling. And we are all still falling, so mm -hmm. thank you for writing that, and thank you for coming out to thank talk you. to us today. Thank and you. I think um, there are, I believe there are a couple microphones in the house, if anybody. Um, well, uh, first off, I wanted to thank you for bringing an astounding amount of class to my guiltiest of guilty pleasures, a little show called Gossip Girl. So <laughs> thank you thoroughly for that. Um, but honestly, what do you feel is one of the greatest hurdles facing playwrights these days, and how do you feel is the best way to overcome it? As long as I've been writing plays, uh, it's at least, let's say, a peculiarity of playwriting that, that there are only two or three playwrights who make a bourgeois living. Um, even though there are thousands of playwrights. So it's a kind of a hobby. Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a, in my case, a charitable, I mean, people have, <laughs> I have been supported by nonprofit uh, I, I have not made a living as a playwright. I've made a living in Gossip Girl and other uh, <laughs> types of entertainment as an actor. Uh, other people have made a living as uh, screenwriters or as uh, teachers. But uh, yes, it's an odd... Uh, it's, it's like being a poet, except that uh, most people have higher hopes. Uh, uh, poets know that they will not make a living <laughs> as poets. Is there another question? So you said that before you were told that America is the best, and then you decided maybe it's worse. But you should remember that it could be much worse. Take, think about Russia, for example. So what will be your comment? Of course, and, uh, I mean, the, the life that the people in this room are, are living, on average, I'm guessing, is a million times better than uh, the life that uh, you know, people lived in 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 uh, the Soviet Union in, in the 1930s. I mean, or in in uh, Nazi Germany. I I'm not implying that uh, we're not. I mean, my life is 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 unbelievably nice, uh, and I'm simply saying that when you look at the history of the United States. I am no longer, and, and politicians still say, this is the greatest country in the world. Uh, looking at the whole history, it, it, it's up there with the oppressive, I mean, the, the, it's a country that's oppressed and harmed and killed a lot of people. <laughs>
looking at the whole sweep. And believe me, it can get much worse here. And I don't think people totally get the significance of the surveillance. People who know about the Soviet Union or about Nazi Germany understand, or East Germany under, you know, the, 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 the East German regime, understand what surveillance means, but uh, don't kid yourself. This, the American government has the power to do all of the things that those governments did. They just haven't decided to use it yet on most of us. But, you know, when J. Edgar Hoover was running the FBI, he recorded the, the uh, bedrooms in which Martin Luther King spent the night, and he went to Martin Luther King through intermediaries. The FBI sent Martin Luther King a letter saying, we have all this, uh, you know, uh, we're going to disgrace you. The only way out is to kill yourself. And Martin Luther King didn't kill himself. But then, you know, Jean Seberg, also, they collected things on her. And she did kill herself, or possibly was murdered. Members of the Black Panther Party were killed. Uh, we're just, this is a nice moment for us, at least, uh, you know, for me, certainly, and, and some of you. It could get much uglier here. And those, so that's, you know, I don't think people are totally getting the meaning of what Snowden revealed, which I think is the, you know, the hottest story of the last several decades having to do with us, you know. Is there another question? I share your enthusiasm for the arts, but I don't understand how you can actually think it reflects a higher level of human being after the Nazis who were, the Germans were among the most cultured of Western societies, revered art, stole art, preserved art, warehoused art, and were the most heinous killers of a century. How, how can you really think that art elevates after that? I don't think, I mean, obviously, reading poetry by itself or playing the violin by itself would not prevent you from uh, um, voting for uh, Hitler. I would uh, question whether his most fervent supporters were the most cultured of that cultured society. It's quite a complicated story. Uh, obviously, there were certain things about uh, uh, Hitler that were attractive even to a, a genius like Martin Heidegger. The country was in disarray and uh, had been brutally defeated and in the First World War, and there were many things that people were very upset by, and Hitler found a way of making people think he could solve certain problems. And uh, there were people who uh, were, you know, in a way, uh, tricked into believing that the Jews had caused their problems. Again, I don't know if the smartest people in Germany were persuaded by that, or after a certain point, they didn't know what to do about it. But yes, it's a question that is challenging, but uh, it hasn't deflected me from my view, although 
you know, I'm the first to say artists should not delude themselves into thinking that they are uh, saving the world. Uh, probably they're not. And in fact, in this play, The Fever, you know, really I'm scornfully mocking artists, if you want to look at it that way. But yes, I do think, I do think that the, um, I don't know, the discipline of art and the intelligence of good art are a step in the right direction. Um, it was so delightful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all of you.